All right, uh, let's continue in this short series of why Christians should meet, why we should meet together. And this morning we're looking at uh, the passage, and I'll look at this passage in a minute, in Acts 2.42. And uh, what I want to uh, talk about this morning about how the Lord's table is connected to the Passover, and uh, something which I've never done before. And what we're doing this morning is basically an overview, a bird's eye view. Uh, can't look into all the details because almost every one of the points I'm going to mention is a sermon in itself. But uh, let's start by looking at the passage in uh, Luke 22, verse 7 uh, to verse 16. <clears throat> then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus said... Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat, uh, eat it. Uh, they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, our God, thank you for your word words that we have in this book is indeed the living word of God. It speaks to us, it was given to us by inspiration by the Holy Spirit. We thank you that it is an infallible book. It is the book that comes from you, the only book, the only words that come from the living God. And thank you, Lord, for uh, the power uh, that is uh, in your word and how it transforms us. And Lord, we pray that you continue to speak to us even as we look into this very important topic of the Lord's table and how it connects to the Old Testament Passover. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, this morning, we continue on this short series of why Christians should meet together. And now that churches have reopened for the past little while, uh, reopened for regular services, uh, we, although not everything is back to normal, it seems to me that believers have become more thankful. I have been. I'm more thankful for the meetings because it's very important for believers to come and meet together. We're more thankful for the importance and freedom to worship together and for the blessings that come when we meet. Uh, that is, we see that it is indeed vital for believers to meet together. It is a matter of life and breath, life and health. For when we meet, we are also meeting with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when Christ says in Matthew 18, I don't have the verse on screen, for when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Christ dwells in all those that belong to him. I see Christ in you and in you and in you, and I rejoice in that. And I'm thankful that I'm not the only believer on the face of the earth. I rejoice in seeing other Christians who love the Lord, and when we meet with, together with, with each other, we're actually meeting with Christ as well. Again, it is a matter, matter of life and health. And so we raise a question at the beginning of this series, why should Christians meet anyway? Why? Why should we meet together? And what are those things that are deemed important to do when we meet together? And we saw, based on the passage in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We saw in the past few weeks the apostles' teaching. Basically what that means is that it is the careful study of God's Word. Christians meet together for the careful study of God's Word. And also fellowship. Fellowship is also very important. We're not a social club, but there's a very definite social aspect to the church. And but when we fellowship, we're having fellowship with Christ, and with each other, and where there's spiritual interaction between believers by and through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And now we're going to look at the breaking of bread, where it says, 
uh, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I looked at the original language, the Greek. Basically, it means the breaking of the bread. Uh, also, could be translated the fracturing of the loaf. And so, whether they had an actual loaf and they would break it apart, uh, I'm not totally sure. But this is what we're doing. We're breaking the bread. We're we're partaking together. And as I was praying and asking the Lord uh, about what to do, what to say about the Lord's Supper, I realized that there was one thing I had never really done before, is to study the origins of the Lord's Supper. I've mentioned many, many times that uh, we see it comes from the Passover. And I thought I would spend the time to look at that this morning. And again, it's a bird's eye view, not a detailed view of everything about the, the Passover and the Lord's Supper. But there are some very important points that we're going to see. And uh, so we saw in Luke chapter 22 a few minutes ago uh, that immediately prior to Jesus giving us instructions on the Lord's Supper, they were engaged in the regular, in the regular Jewish practice of the Passover. They were celebrating the Passover together. Is there a connection? Is there a connection between the two? Well, absolutely there is. It's quite obvious because Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples and then he said, now I'm going to show you a new way to partake, to participate in the Passover. And so we see in celebrating the Passover, Jesus presented to his disciples a new way to practice the Passover. He was teaching them the new practice of the Passover for all, for all believers of the new covenant era, now being called the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper or the Breaking of Bread. And in ga gaining an understanding of this, I believe it will benefit all of us as followers of Christ. And so, a question. Looking at the context of when the Passover and the Lord's Supper were given, do we see any parallels or similar themes or events or teachings or characters between the two, between the Passover and the Lord's Supper? And there are many parallels. There are many things that are very similar, and that's what we're going to look at. Again, some things we're just going to uh, look at uh, very briefly. And, uh, and so there are several things, and there are others, and I can't mention them all, uh, maybe in a future date. So then, number one, in contrasting the Passover and the Lord's Supper, we see the similar theme of slavery. Of slavery. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel had become the, had become the welcomed uh, guests of the Egyptians. When Joseph was there, and then the whole family of Joseph and Jacob and their brothers, they all came there. They were the welcome guests. But we know that many years later, the Egyptians had placed the Israelites under a yoke of bondage and became their slaves under the rule of Pharaoh. And this is Exodus chapter 1. Look at what it says in Exodus 1, verse uh, 11. It says here, so they put slave masters over them, the, the Jewish people, to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. And so they were trapped. They had no way to escape, because if they tried, they would have brought them back. And so this is a picture, in, in, in essence, or a type or representation given, given to us to speak of our own slavery to sin. Um, look at what it says in uh, John 8, 34. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. In other words, I raised this question before, are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we are sinners? I'll say that again. Are we sinners just because we have sinned? Or do we sin because at the root we are sinners? The answer is obvious, the second one. Because, and Jesus says here, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, so we're all born slaves to sin. Uh, it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And um, King David says in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He realized his mom and dad were married, and they, but yet when he was conceived, he was a sinner in his mother's womb. And when he was born, he was still a sinner. 
So we're all born sinners. So we sin because we are sinners. And so Jesus says that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. We were all slaves to our sins prior to being freed from our sins by the power of the cross applied to us. And so we see a, uh, a definite parallel uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament Jews were slaves to the Egyptians, and we are slaves to our sins. So following with this, uh, we see that, number two, in contrasting the Passover and the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, we see the similar theme of deliverer. There's a deliverer. In their bondage and slavery to the Egyptians, the Jews needed a deliverer, a savior, to lead them out of Egypt. Of course, this person was Moses. In Acts chapter 7, it says the following, This is the same Moses they had. This is Stephen, uh, who became the first martyr of the church, who was preaching to the, the Jews, who, and then he stoned him to death shortly after. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And so Moses is described as a type or a representation of Christ. His person and what he did, his work, his role of delivering, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many pictures like that in the Old Testament. And in Christ, by the cross or through the cross, the Lord Jesus, he delivers us from our own slavery to sin. We were in slavery. We were in bondage, just like the Egyptians were. And so the Lord, by the cross, he redeems us. He sets us free by the power of his blood. <clears throat> Look at what it says in a couple of passages in Galatians 5, 1 and Romans 8. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Uh, Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no, cond no condemnation to those, for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the Lord Jesus is the one who sets us free. He is our deliverer. So we see in these two themes of slavery and deliverer, that we are reminded that for the Jews, as they celebrated the Passover, they were reminded that they were once slaves to Pharaoh, but God raised up a deliverer, a savior, a Messiah to save them. And for us, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we take part in communion in the Lord's table, we are reminded of our own slavery to sin, but God raised up a deliverer, a Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is the one who, who redeemed us, who freed us. Number three, in contrasting the Passover and the Lord's table, we see the similar theme of a lamb. A lamb. In Exodus 12.3 and 12.5, it says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, uh, a year old. Now, <clears throat> what title was given to the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to our world? What title was given to the Lord Jesus? John the Baptist says, <clears throat> where am I? <laughs> there we go. John the Baptist says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But the Holy Spirit moved him to say those words. He saw Jesus, a distant relative of his, and he said, this is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of what was spoken of in the Old Testament. All the lambs, the Passover lamb. This is Jesus who is a fulfillment of that. Uh, in 1 Peter 1.18, Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. In the Old Testament, one of the requirements for uh, a lamb to be sacrificed that is that it had to be perfect. It had no blemishes, no, no spots, no imperfections. And that is a picture of Christ because Christ is the one who is without blemish and without spot. He is one who, the one who is sinless. Uh, where God says he was tempted in every way just like us, but apart from sin. Christ was tempted yet he never sinned. And so Christ is that spotless Lamb of God. So we see the theme of the Lamb between the Old Testament and the New Testament 
which is what we celebrate at the Lord's table. And so when we come to the Lord's table, we remember, we remember Jesus as being our lamb. He's my lamb, the lamb of God. Number four, and the lamb leads us to, to these other common themes of blood, of death, and of life. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, God gave them the command to practice the Passover. They were given specific instructions. And I want to turn to Exodus 12, 21 to 23. And it says here, Then Moses called on the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, that is a branch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, basin, both sides of the doorpost at the entrance of your home, none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow you, uh, not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Thus, in this context, we see the presence of the blood and the lamb, that is the death of a lamb, on the doorposts of the homes, guaranteeing the safety and the life of, to those for those who obeyed and believed the message of Moses. And of course, death for those who did not believe. And so what we find in the New Testament is their blood, is their death, is their life. Well, absolutely. In uh, going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, <clears throat> it says here, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways, uh, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Uh, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption. Redemption means life. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. It's wonderful, isn't it, to see these, all these parallels? Well, there's more to come. Um, <clears throat> our Lord Jesus shed his blood there on the cross, for he is our Passover lamb. And look at what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Sometimes it doesn't want to go. There we go. <clears throat> 5 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Hebrews 9.22 Indeed, under the law, most, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no, forgive, no forgiveness of sins. In other words, so he's saying here, with the shedding of blood, there is forgiveness of sins. So there has, the blood has to be shed, just like in the Old Testament. Thus, for the New Testament, God presents his son Jesus as the lamb, where his blood needed to be spilled, which led to his death there on the cross. And those who believe, who place their trust in Christ alone, receive life, eternal life, but those who reject death and eternal condemnation awaits them. The Word of God makes it very clear. Number five, in contrasting the Passover lamb, the Passover rather, and the Lord's table, we see the similar themes of God's wrath unleashed and averted. We see God's wrath unleashed and averted. Untold numbers of lambs were sacrificed on that evening when God commanded Israel to observe the Passover. And from that point on, how many lambs were sacrificed in the Old Testament? How many? Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. I don't know. The lambs were substitutes. These were slain and punished where their blood was shed to the point of death. And these lambs are a picture of Christ, who is our Lamb of God, who shed his blood. But note that, that for those whose homes had the blood applied, the wrath of God was averted, that is, turned away. The wrath of God did not, uh, was not unleashed upon the families where the blood was. Because the angel of the Lord, which is actually, it says in capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means Yahweh, God himself, and he saw the blood, and so the, his wrath was not 
uh, was not unleashed, but rather his wrath was averted. Going to um, Exodus 12, 23 and 29 says, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the, on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord, again Yahweh himself, will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Verse 29, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn, firstborn of the livestock. And so, going to the New Testament now, what happened to Christ on the cross? What happened to him? This is where the wrath of God was unleashed upon his only son. Matthew 27, 45 and 46, one of the great verses of the New Testament. It says, now from the sixth hour, I think that's around 12, uh, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, around three o'clock. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting the Old Testament, one of the Psalms. And at, at that point in time, the wrath of God was unleashed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was our substitute. He's the one who took our punishment. In many of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, the, uh, the, the teaching known as the scapegoat, where the, the priest would put his hands on the goat and confess the sins of Israel over the goat and the, the, the goat was released into the wilderness. So this is what God did. He placed uh, our sins upon Christ and confessed the sins of Christ, <laughs> uh, our sins upon Christ and he was the one that was punished. That's why Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered separation from the Father there on the cross. So this is what is known as the work of atonement where Christ as our substitute became the only worthy sacrifice before the Father, since he was sinless, without sin. Upon him, our sins were placed. And Christ was regarded, he was looked upon as a filthy, as a vile sinner before the Father. And he was the acceptable sacrifice. Jesus was punished, and he cried out, and he died. Look at what it says in John chapter 3. Jesus says, Whoever believes in him, that is Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. <clears throat> 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That is, whoever places his trust in the person of Christ alone has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God <clears throat> remains on him. So then the wrath of God was poured out unto his only son, so that for all who believe, who have trusted in Christ, the wrath of God is turned away. Trust in Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Trust in Christ today, and God's wrath will be turned away from you when he sees the blood applied to your heart. But the wrath of God, again, remains on all the, uh, upon all the unrepentant until they turn from sin. Point number six. <clears throat> In contrasting the Passover and the Lord's table, we see the similar theme of remembrance. After the actual event of the first Passover, all practicing Jews were called to remember God's act of delivering them from the destroyer. Look at what it says in uh, Exodus 12:23 to 27. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, and he will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this as a right and as a statute, a statute for you and for your sons for forever. And when you come into the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. Continue to do this as a remembrance. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worshipped. So we see that the Passover was an act of remembrance. But there's another side to this that I want to bring out. In the sacrificial system that was part of the Old Testament, 
which was an elaborate and detailed, it's really quite detailed. If you look at all, look at all the uh, sacrifices and the type of sacrifices, it's something I, I have not mastered myself. But it was, was quite elaborate and detailed. Animals were sacrificed by the hundreds of thousands and even in the millions through the course of centuries. But these, you know what? They offered only a temporary covering or temporary forgiveness for sins. Let's go to the New Testament. What, what it says in uh, Hebrews 10. Shane, could you move it for There we go. All right. Um, Hebrews 10, 1. And the author of Hebrews says, For since the law, and the author definitely had in mind here the ceremonial laws as well. The law has but a shadow of the good things to come, that is the New Covenant, the New Testament. Instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. So there was a flaw as part of the Old Testament uh, system. Uh, it, was, it wasn't perfect. It was perfect for the purposes of the, the, for the Old Testament, but it wasn't perfect because it pointed to the New Testament to something better. And verse 2 says, Otherwise would they have not ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But he says, But in these sacrifices of the Old Testament, there is a reminder. And the word reminder there is also the word remembrance, and which is the word in the Greek, anamnesis. Now, uh, you well know what amnesia is, is basically you forget. Mm -hmm. Well, the word here is basically you don't forget. Ana, which means you don't forget. Uh, it's, um, so again, there's a reminder or a remembrance of sins every year. So every year you'd have to go and it's a reminder that my sins have not been dealt with. I've not been dealt with completely. And it says here, verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of gold, or bulls and goats to take away sin. Because if they could, the sin, the, uh, the sacrifices would have continued on forever. Thus, in the Old Testament period, with the practice of all the sacrifices, with the Day of Atonement, and with the observance of the Passover, the Jewish people were remembering God's delivery. But it was also a reminder that their sins were not done away with. Otherwise, the sacrifices would have ceased a long time ago. So let's contrast this with Christ's sacrifice and, <clears throat> and the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians 11.23, and this is the uh, passage that I read from uh, a lot with, regarding communion, and Paul says the following, For I received from the Lord... What I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Anamnesis. Again, the same word. Do this in remembrance. It is a remembrance. The Lord's table is a remembrance, just like the Old Testament Passover. In the same way, he also took the cup, saying, This is the cup. Uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Same word. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're personally announcing that as a believer, one has trusted in Christ and proclaiming that Christ died. He died for me and then he one day is going to come back. Thus, the Lord's table is a table of remembrance. It is not a place where there is a constant reminder of sin and that is not uh, of sin and that is it is not to take away um, so the Old Testament system it's a constant reminder of sin but in the New Testament it's a constant reminder of Christ we remember Christ he says do this in remembrance of me not your sins but do this in remembrance of me it is a place where we remember Christ himself which means that as we remember him, we remind ourselves of his victory on the cross and his great love for us. So some concluding thoughts here uh, this morning. Much more can be said, a whole lot more can be said. But again, this is a bird's eye view. It is a, uh, an overview of some of the things that are important. So two things I want to bring out. Number one, when the Passover was celebrated in the Old Testament, where they were, there was, there was drinking of wine, and I, and I did my research on this. There was actual wine that was drank, uh, drunk, and uh, they were uh, eating the meat, the, 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 the lamb, 
and there was also eating of unleavened bread as well. Were these elements ever transformed into something else at any point in time during the celebration? No. These things remained what they were. Meat, bread, and wine. We just saw in Exodus 12 that the Passover was indeed uh, was intended to be a visual reminder, uh, a remembrance of God's grace. Look at what it says in Hebrews, uh, actually, uh, Exodus 12, verse 14, and 26 and 27. It says here, This day shall be for you a memorial day, as a remembrance. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is the service, the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And so we have to be consistent with Scripture. When we interpret the Old Testament, we have to interpret the New Testament in the same way. There was never, there has never been a hint that the elements of the wine or the bread or the lamb, the meat, there was never a hint that these were transformed into something else, like the actual body and blood of Moses, for example. Right? We don't see that. If you approach a Jew and say, well, this is what happened, well, say, well you're out of your mind. This is not what happens. It just, it just remains bread. It remains uh, wine or the cup. It remains the cup and everything else. And so, even so, the Christian Lord's Supper is also a remembrance where the elements are not transformed. They're not changed. I was taught when I was a, a youth that these things were changed. You know, it became the actual blood and uh, the actual body of Jesus. And I was eating those things. It's completely inconsistent with Scripture. And so, how do we explain this then? Well, I heard this years ago. Somebody explained it this way, and I think it makes sense. In a sense, taking the bread and the cup in our hands is like this. If I uh, were to take my cell phone and say... Uh, and show you a picture of my wife and say, this is my wife. You know, some might say, oh. <laughs> but if you were to say, if I were to say, this is my wife, say, what? <laughs> the phone is your wife? <laughs> well, this is the, the image is your wife? <laughs> but this is where people take literally what should not be taken literally. It's figurative. And so if I were to take another picture and say, this is my son. <laughs> I don't have a son, but, but I, uh, so this is what Jesus meant. So when he said, this is my body, and this is my blood, he's saying, this, these are representations of my body and my blood. These are not my actual, this is not my actual body, this is not my actual blood. Again, it's because in our weakness, we need visuals to remind ourselves, right? And so... We have a picture of our wife or our spouse and to remind us you know, how much we love our spouse. Right? So we, we, we need visuals. And so Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper to, so that we can be reminded of Jesus' death, of, who, of what he has done and his great love for us. So again, it's not actual, uh, um, the bread has not become the body of Christ and the, the blood has not become the blood of Christ. These are representations to help us. The other thing I want to mention is that we see that there are very clear and definite parallels between the Old Testament Passover and the Lord's Table. So in truth, the Old is fulfilled in the New. The Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. The Old Testament expression of the Passover is fulfilled in the New Testament expression of the Lord's Table. And the, these are both remembrances. These are memorials. Biblical revelation is progressive. Little by little, God added to the picture to help us understand. And which, uh, in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if we were only given the New Testament, would we be able to understand much of the language in it? No. The Old Testament had to be given first. The physical uh, representations had to be given first. These are called shadows. And so, you know, if you're outside on a sunny day, you know, uh, person's on the other side of the wall and you see the shadow of the person, uh, you, you, know, you have an idea of what the person's all about, or only a very vague idea. And so that's what we see in the Old Testament. Pictures of Christ, representations of Christ were shadows, they were vague, it wasn't really very clear. And so now Christ coming, he presented the new covenant, and so now, which means now we don't need the Old Testament anymore, we don't return there as some may try to 
uh, move us in that direction. Um, which is why moving on from the Old Testament sacrificial system, God now, said, God now says that this period was given for a time until one would come, that is Jesus, one would come to fulfill all that it was speaking about, Jesus Christ and the cross. Thus now in the New Covenant, for the people of God, consisting in Jewish and Gentile believers, we have one identity together, we are God's people, we are united in Christ, people from every nation. And we have one common practice together, which is the Lord's table. If you're a believer, you come to the table which is a place and time where we partake on a regular basis to remember the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So going back to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body. This is a representation of my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is a new covenant, Christ is saying. This is a new way of doing the Passover. It's not called the Lord's Supper. Uh, so it says here, the new covenant in my blood, the blood of Christ, not of bulls or of lambs. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Look at verse 26. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, that's in the present tense. You proclaim the Lord's death, which is in the past, until he comes, and that's the future. And so when we take part, we're indicating that we're speaking about the, the, the present and the past and the future, all surrounded by Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27, it says also, <clears throat> Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Exactly what that means, I'm not totally sure. But I know that uh, unbelievers are not called to come to the table. And secondly, if a believer is involved in active sin, a Christian should not come to the table. As he says, hey, let, let a person examine himself. Then so, and, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. You know, this was a problem in the Corinthian church because Paul says, some of you have fallen asleep. Some believers were disobedient and they were going to the Lord's table uh, in an improper, improper way. And because of that, the Lord took them home. They died uh, in, uh, in a way that was not predicted. I guess I'm not sure how to say that. And so, just to conclude here this morning, what is the condition for anyone to come to the Lord's table? Salvation. If you're saved, if you're a believer, if Christ's blood has applied, been applied to you, you are a worthy candidate. Come to the table. The Lord has saved you. You are now a believer. If you're saved, you're worthy to come. We may feel unworthy in ourselves, and I do, and we all do, but the Lord says it's for sinners, it's for redeemed sinners. Come as you are. And because we have been declared righteous in the sight of God, when the Lord saves you, He has declared you righteous in His sight like a judge, making a pronouncement and saying, you are now righteous you're now declared righteous in my sight. You're declared just in my sight. Plus, you have been covered. You have been credited with Christ's perfect righteousness. Christ's righteousness of his has been imputed to your account. We stand before God not in our own righteousness, but in Christ's righteousness. When Christ walked in perfection on the face of the earth, that human righteousness and perfection has been placed to our account. That's why the Lord accepts us and receives us. Not because of anything we've done. Not because of our works, but because of Christ's work. We're saved by works, but not our works, but we're saved by Christ's works. Mm -hmm. And so, and the way you become a Christian is by personally placing your trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I quote this verse uh, many, many times in Acts uh, 16, verse 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, place your trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, not in your works, not in your your denominational membership, not in your baptism, not in anything else. Trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He says, you and your household. You and your household, anyone in your household who also believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And that's the condition. So, much more can be said, but we see a definite...
parallel between the Old Testament Passover and the New Testament uh, Lord's Supper. And uh, let us, kind of, I know much more can be said. <laughs> I thought of other things I could say, but we'll leave that for some, some other time. And uh, let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Lord, we uh, are thankful for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sins. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. And again, Lord, we have seen so many things this morning in brief form, and we uh, so many more things can be said. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless as we uh, plunge into the greatness of Christ's sacrifice, and uh, that Christ is indeed is our Passover lamb who has taken away our sins forever. And Lord, whenever we partake at the Lord's table, we do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, and not in remembrance of our sins, because our sins have been taken away as far as the east is from the west. So far have you removed our sins from us. We thank you. We thank you that Christ has come and performed a great and a perfect sacrifice for us. We pray that you would bless, bring people to, to saving faith. We pray that you would bring salvation to even someone here today. Bless, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.